Hello and welcome to the Avram Rosenzweig Show. My name is Avram Rosenzweig and I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, we have a very special show today. It's a little bit out of the, uh, the ordinary podcast that we do on Sunday afternoons. Um, as you know from previous podcasts, uh, the Avram Rosenzweig Show has a reporter in Israel, reporter extraordinaire, uh, whose name is Devorah Mason. Devorah is here with us today. Devorah, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, I'm wonderful. Thank you. Good. And uh, Devorah is an adventuresome uh, individual who has been living in Israel for a number of years, originally a Torontonian, and she travels up and down, north and south, um, to determine exactly where our country, Israel, is at in terms of uh, the people who have been affected by October 7th and afterwards. Uh, in fact, most recently, um, as of February 20th, actually, she was in the north with many different types of uh, groups of people, including entrepreneurs, government officials, and so on, uh, meeting with individuals who have been evacuated um, and companies who are trying to return to what would have been normal. Now, this was preceded by uh, two trips, actually, to the south, one of which we reported on, and again, with a similar uh, mission. So let's cut right to the chase and uh, welcome Devora, our reporter in Israel. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, Devora, and for initiating this. I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thanks, Avram, for having patience during this crazy time. It's kind of hard for us to to get online together at different time zones and each one with their own uh, schedule, but I'm glad we got a chance to do this. Yeah, no, that's okay. G give us a bit of your background in a couple sentences. So people have a sense of who you are. You live in Jerusalem, you have kids. What takes you to these different places around Israel? Well, I think I'm very Zionistic to a fault. Uh, you know, I, I, I always say to people, I'm the only person in this room who has made Aliyah, moved to Israel twice. Uh, so the first time you make Aliyah, you don't really know what you're in for, so you can give that excuse. Mm -hmm. But if you come back again, then you know you're coming back, what you're coming back to. Uh, so, you know, my parents have always been Zionistic. I moved to Israel in 1990 for the first time as a teenager in my high school years in Israel and Jerusalem during a very difficult time. The Gulf War, uh, Russian Aliyah, uh, the Intifada in Jerusalem. It was a difficult time, you know, and Jerusalem wasn't the city this today it was hard to go off there. And, and, uh, I remember even going to the ministry of the interior when I moved to Israel and they said to me, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Canada. And they said, why are you here? Go home. Like, I said, well, I am home, but you know, that was, it's hard for them to understand why North Americans would be moving or leaving North America today. I think we have a better sense of that. Um, and then I left and went back to Toronto, did university there, got married, and four of my kids were born in Toronto and we didn't want them to have to come at its teenagers the way I had to experience Aliyah. And so we moved with my oldest uh, still in, in finishing first grade, first grade. And uh, when we came to Israel, you know, my fifth was born here. Um, I'm a single mother for many, many years. So, you know, I've, uh, I've had the, uh, you know, the opportunity and the, uh, I guess you could say uh, the blessing to raise five kids here in Israel with a great co-parent. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, the second time around, I was already more fluent in Hebrew. I was more aware of what's happening here. And I kind of just got myself into the, uh, the tech world and started to build up my career through that. And I worked for startups, innovation programs, uh, at a consulting company, uh, joined us, you know, different, I worked in different themes across as well. And then, uh, with COVID, I kind of closed my company, pivoted into another, company. And a few years ago, I joined the, the tech investment world. So that's where I am today. Um, you know, and I have family here and I see that, you know, my family has come and gone over the years, moving abroad for a few years, coming back. I have a brother in Texas. Uh, but overall, you know, I, today I live in Jerusalem and, um, and, you know, my, my firm that I work for has offices in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, in the North, in New York, um, and in the South. So, Definitely, I work in a firm that that has a you know that is uh, that works with my vision and my mission, which is to work on bringing uh, developing tech in Israel, bringing investments into tech in Israel, and also helping to do economic development across Israel uh, to help the uh, economy thrive and grow and bring companies into the global market. That's you know that's my mission. Devora, in Canada, 
which is where you stem from, I would say that the overall emotion that most of us feel, if this is emotion indeed, is one of safety and security, right? The main filter that we have as Canadians, we're comfortable, we're safe. What's the main filter that you have as an Israeli? So firstly, I have to say, I feel safe in Israel. I feel very safe. I actually feel more safe every time I come back. You know, I travel a lot. I travel almost every month. Um, I was recently in the U.S. last month. And, you know, I every time I land back in Israel, I feel safe. I'm so happy to be here. I feel a sense of security and safety being in Israel. So definitely, I think that is, you know, this we have that same emotion. And I know a lot of people lost their sense of security and safety um, after October 7th. But I still see Israel as being my, you know, my home, my and my place where I feel secure. Um, I think Israelis are, you know, why they always say, why does the tech market so so successful? You know, why is innovation such a big part of our lives? And I think in a large part, it's because the country is a lot, has a lot of times been in survival mode. I'm having to find solutions to things that would otherwise you know, be solved, you know, in other ways across, you know, in the, in the global market, people solve them other ways, sometimes even just money or space or, you know, a lot not being surrounded by enemies. And, you know, in Israel, I think that we've had to find solutions. I think the first drone was created by, you know, there's this innovation museum here in Israel. And the first drone ever was created by someone who wanted to be able to see over the border gate, but didn't know how to do it. So we, there were these boys who, for their bar mitzvahs, they get these gifts of like these the electric airplanes you know like you this and the airplane goes and he attached his video camera to the bottom of the airplane and <laughs> took it from this kid from mitzvah kid you know and flew it like that you know over the over the gate to be able to get videos of something that you know that today's drones do so that's innovation right yeah. like yeah. that's innovation. so obviously we're much more sophisticated than that i think that was in the 70s okay but uh, if you go through the innovation, you see the things that have developed, definitely unique. Um, and then the people themselves, oftentimes, you know, 19, 20 year olds in Canada, you know, they're get, they get a degree that doesn't solve much for them in their lives. and doesn't give them much direction here when, you know, there's uh, there's mandatory service in the army. So many of them are coming out of intelligence units um, and they're coming out with skills at the age of 20 and 21 that is helping them to grow their next startup, to understand the world of cyber and innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, tech, you know. There was uh, one of our companies, we were just talking about this, they um, they had worked in a secret unit, um, you know, in the army and they worked in um, sensors, IoT sensors, like, you know, and so their company that they developed later on was sensors for uh, solving uh, in, um, bugs and, and uh, mites that go into trees and affect trees. Through this technology, they're saving forestry. Hmm. It's amazing to see these things. So, you know, that's so survival leads us to create, to be innovative. And and that's the Israeli mentality. And, and one of the things I mentioned to you before is that I feel like the country overall has become a social, maybe a socialist. I don't know if I should say so, but a socially based run com country since October 7th. So much of what's happening in the country is being done by private organizations, by private individuals, by donors, by, you know, people who are strong leaders who are just taking that lead and making yes. things happen without waiting around. Just before we dive into your actual trips, because that, that really is the compelling part of this interview, I believe. In the central part of Israel, I think generally uh, people who live in Jerusalem and thereabouts probably feel safer after October 7th and even prior than those living in the South and the North. Would that be accurate? Yeah. Well, I think people in the South have, you know, uh, for the most part moved out of those areas for now, either because they've been destroyed. Um, there's, you know, a lack of security or lack of safety, not all regions and not all people, but definitely I think that's happened quite a bit. And in the North, they've evacuated um, many of the residents, you know, whether it was against their will or, you know, with their with their complicity, but in general, moving them uh, to to read to areas outside of those border um, cities and 
and border communities. And so that's that's right by the borders and definitely they don't feel safe. And I think that that's you know, part of why they're away. You know, they've been evacuated or they're not going back. But then there's also the regions that are in the line of fire. You know, um, well, I remember one time when I was in the South, I saw rockets overhead and I got, you get notifications we have an ad that tells us, you know, where, which region based on the trajectory of the, of the rocket, which region uh, should go into their safe rooms. And I could see all of these regions in the South and, and then areas on the coast. And, you know, they all have to constantly running into their safe rooms. Many times they're sleeping there with their kids overnight. You know, we've, I mean, that, that doesn't create a, a sense of safety, but Jerusalem has its other challenges. So uh, it's a blended city uh, there. You know, when you talk about East and West Jerusalem, it's not a border. It's a street. You cross the street <laughs> and yes. now you're in East Jerusalem, yes. you cross the street back. Now you're in West Jerusalem, you know, so it's a blended city. And so there are oftentimes people who are, who are going to perpetrate attacks on other civilians in the city. And that's really difficult as Jerusalemites to feel, you know, okay about that or feel safe, you know, when those things are happening. Devorah, the, in the north, indeed, there have been a people of uh, people who have been evacuated. I interviewed Levav Weinberg two weeks ago, who was the uh, previous president of, of Israel Hockey, and once Ooh. October, yeah, he's a fascinating fellow. Once October seventh happened, his wife and his son, I believe, went to Haifa uh, to live with uh, their their family in laws, and I and I wonder to myself, although it's clearly safer, and when you're a parent. That's what you want to do with your kids is to make sure that they're not under attack. But is in terms of the evacuees, is there any shame in leaving their home? So I feel like I've, I've heard such a wide range of stories. You know how there's not one, well, there's not one emotion. There's not one answer. It's a good question. Um, Maybe I'll just share a couple of stories just to give a, a, a bit of a sense of like people uh, and their emotions they've shared. Uh, one person, he was in the uh, the task force, the defense force of a, of a place in the south called Nativa Sara. And, um, you know, soon after, uh, after defending uh, their community and many people were killed. But, you know, after a couple, I think it was about 24, 40 hours of defending their community. He packed his kids up and family into three cars, and he said it reminded him of the Holocaust where he put each one in a different car, not knowing if all the cars would make it, but that someone from his family should survive. But he didn't mention that to him. He just said, oh, here's room in this car. Sit here. Here's room in the... And then taking them out of there, and they also, they went to Tel Aviv or to Haifa to their family, and we asked him, will you come back? I mean, this community is stunning. All these gorgeous homes. You know, you know, right on the border, right by the border crossing where they used to also, uh, all of them used to go and pick up uh, Palestinians from Gaza to bring them in for medical care into the country. So they're right there. And I said to him, would you go back? And he said, I won't go back if my kids won't go back. And one of his kids are adamant about not going back. So, you know, he's in the meantime is still defending the community and, and living there and uh, you know, they're, they're him and another, I think another, uh, like a big group of, of soldiers and so on are there in that community defending it, but his family hasn't come back. And that was about a month ago or a month and a half ago. So, you know, I, I don't know what has changed. Obviously life is dynamic. Right. So that's one story. Um, another story is someone, you know, a famous, uh, news, uh, news persona who, you know, she had lived. Uh, south by the border and in, in one of these Shuvim. I'm also not giving too much details. But I don't want to, I don't think it's fair to share more than that, but right. Um, and, and there was only one couple, an older elderly couple who went back and moved back into their home in that, in that, uh, Yishuv, in that you know, community. And they said, this is our home. This is all we know. We're going home and what will be, will be. And they were the only ones. And some young people started to join that community as well because they were interested in working in the factories, they were in the agriculture. Younger people are, you know, a little bit, they're better soldiers than us old people who, you know, are, are a little bit more risk averse. And uh, they, this, there were, there are still tunnels underneath that they don't know of. 
And although it wasn't in the news, there was a there's an infiltration through one of those tunnels into that community since October 7th, with that couple living there, the soldiers, and obviously it was it was stopped, but that doesn't create a sense of security and for the people because they know about it. The people who are from that community know about it, heard yes. about it, and it's going to be very hard. And they said, we're not going back at this point. Doesn't mean that there won't be people who will go back. Doesn't mean that they won't be able to resettle it. But it's a lot of work right now in getting people to feel safe again. I think it's it's beyond, it's certainly beyond me, and I'm sure it's beyond most people as to what it means to evacuate your home, your your city or your village, your area that you live in for so many years. If you have kids in particular, that means, you know, where do you take them to the doctor, God forbid, if they need it? Yeah. You know, if you have a dent dental problems, who who is your dentist? And in Livov's case, you know, his family's way out in Haifa. That's not their home. They're there for Metula. So uh, the Brown, germ, the germ. To, yeah, sorry, I have to just tell you something because, like, it just came. A lot of the hotels have become the homes of these evacuees. Yeah. Sorry. Sometimes I walk by a hotel and I'll see a little kid's doll sitting in the window because that's their home now. You don't usually see that in regular hotels. The no, people you don't. Are transit, like they, they transit, they come in, they go. And I was just thinking about that. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I mean, you you buttressed my point very well. It's just so dramatic. If someone uh, insisted that I leave my home here and had to go many miles away, the kilometers, how would I adjust to that? So listen, this is a really good segue to launch into the treks, the journeys that you have made over the last couple months um, to both the south, southern part of Israel, as well as the north. Um, so I want to, I want to turn this over to you. We actually have a picture presentation mm -hmm. as obviously, as well as a uh, narrative behind that with Devora. And, uh, let's, let's start in the South. Uh, you, you went on December 24th to stay roads, Akim Kvar Aza, right. And you basically did a walkthrough of, uh, what had happened there. And you also met with soldiers and subsequently at the end of the trip had a barbecue. We did report on that a little bit. Do you just want to give us a synopsis of that trip and then take us into your January 14th trip in the South? Yeah. So um, one of the reasons I go, first of all, I, I feel like it's important for me to go wherever, uh, everywhere in Israel. Like I don't want to be limited. I don't want to feel limited. And that's something I kind of learned from my grandmothers. Um, I rem anyways, it's, uh, it's, I remember when I first moved back to Israel, um, at one point I was feeling a little bit scared and my grand, one of my grandmothers said to me, <clears throat> you know, I, I used to feel scared and then I realized I can't fear anything but God. And that way I lived my life much more peacefully. Okay. So I tried to implement that in my life. Very good. It's definitely very useful. Um, and, uh, I want to be able to go places cause as I mentioned to you around like, these things are, are trend, like, you know, a lot of the places, let's say, you know, and, and God forbid, I mean, uh, the camps in, in Europe and so on, they created museums around them and so on. But anyone who saw it right after, they were witnesses and they had the um, responsibility, I guess I would say, to witness um, as, uh, as the responders and as the liberators and so on. I'm not a responder and I'm not a liberator. But I did get to hear the stories from first responders themselves as they took us through different areas in the south and showed us a lot of the atrocities that were, you know, the, the remnants of, of, of what the battle looked like and telling us their firsthand stories yes. um, because they were first responders. And that was something that, you know, in two years from now won't be there. God willing, things will come back and people will come back and, you know, we'll reopen and relive and and bring back, you know, the vitality of those regions. But right now I felt like it was my responsibility and it was like my, my, you know, my right to go and to, to uh, witness that uh, because it's, it's, I'm here. It's my generation. Unfortunately, like we're here. Take, um, take us through, take us through those, those trips down South. Maybe we should do the pictorials right now. Yeah. You want to do that? Okay. Yeah. Let me do yeah. that just a minute. So um, I'm going to share that. Um, Devor, I'm just wondering while you're setting that up, were you frightened uh, of what no. you were about to see? No, no. 
I, I don't feel, I mean, like, that. I don't know if it's a good thing, but I don't generally feel fear. Um, for better or for worse. Except for God. Except for God, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tell me if you can see this. Yeah, so this I can was, see it. you know, the first time we went, they made us put on these, uh, you know, jackets and, and helmets and walk through, you know, and I, I took a picture of the fruit trees because there was something to me, there's something to me in general always about the way nature thrives when humans destroy. Interesting. Yeah. And so, you know, I just kept walking through and noticing this beautiful greenery. What area are we looking at now? So right now we're in Kfar Aza. So in Kfar, look at the sky. I mean, look at this. Like we're walking through devastation and this is the border. Um, it, there's different you know, markings it, on the houses. Um, I'm just going to go through because I don't think families always want to see there. You know, um, you know, Devor, Devor, I don't know what October 7th was like itself in terms of the weather, but I often thought when I was reading Holocaust literature you know, uh, you know, one thing said on an awful day, a rainy day or a snowy day, how terrible it must have been for the people in the camps. But sometimes I think to myself, how terrible it must have been for the people in the camps when the sky was blue. You could hear the right. birds. Yeah, right. Like right. you're not, you don't feel human, but right. there's like this something, there's some sort of human, like that's it's like that nature of life and life that keeps going on. So this was, you know, they walked us through. This is an area where a lot of the people, the younger, you can see the signs on the on the houses that they put. If someone was kidnapped, they wrote, you know, from this house, so-and-so was kidnapped. If someone was killed, they write from this house, so-and-so was killed. Um, and this was the younger area. This is where all the younger people uh, lived. As they, in a kibbutz, when you reach 18, you have the right to a piece of land. And so they would give them, but they wanted to live around the young people. So they would give them this land, you know, and some of these people afterwards, I went back and I sort of like started to research and look them up and see who is this person? Who is that person? Like, you know, I wanted to read more about them. Like this guy, he had beer bottles on his doorstep and the families had asked us not to come in. So I went back and researched to see why. And it was this joke that the friends had that anytime they sat down, I think there were eight beer bottles. He could always drink eight beer bottles in one sitting, which they were very impressed by. For Canadians, that's not impressive. But, <laughs> it's, right. you know, so like, you know, and so you just go through and then I see this fruit tree and I'm just like, all the fruits are falling on the ground. No one's picking them. No one's eating them. So anyways, this was the younger area. One family decided to let people come into their child's home where they had been killed and um and to be able to see what it was like in their last moments there um and to they put a guest book there for you'd also sign and leave a, a message for the family like or a wish or you know or or support so you know as you go through and you see this like you know you're you're just so, so this was the house where sivan and the had been killed the family created sort of a uh a museum of sorts where you could come in and see what it is they went through, get a sense of their lives, see a little bit of like what was there before their last WhatsApp messages, um, you know, and uh, where they were in their safe room, where they were for those hours before yeah. uh, they were killed. So, you know, this was, uh, this was, this was the walkthrough and it was really, uh, it was really, really, important i felt like for me to go and to see this you see the border like right outside as we drove through um sorry i think that stop um and and i think that uh that was uh that was something that was you know really really meaningful um i'm just going to restart again because it just stopped for a second but from there we went to sterot um and in sterot um so I don't know if you remember, but uh, there were a lot of pictures of these painted um, uh, kind of uh, protective places where people go and there's a rocket attack in the South. They don't have that many much time to get to a shelter. And they've been painted to create a sense of like, not just having a, a cement block in the middle of the uh, street, you know? So they've been painting them to make them uh, look 
you know, different. And a lot of them that have been painted, you see them in videos uh, where people have gone in and been killed afterwards. So, but this is in Sterot. Sterot was mostly evacuated. Sterot was a little bit of a different story. They didn't go into people's homes. Instead, what they did was they uh, just went around the streets shooting civilians on the street. Um, and so, you know, if you know the story of the elderly who were in a bus on their way to a uh, trip to Yam HaMelech, to the Dead Sea, and they were picking up some people there and they, they killed the entire bus load of, of elderly um, on the streets of Sterot. This is the yeshiva of Sterot. It's a Hezder yeshiva. And well, hey, what, what is a Hezder yeshiva? So it's a yeshiva where you, uh, part of your mandatory army service, you fluctuate between studying and serving. Um, so I think it's like 18 months studying uh, in yeshiva, 18 months serving. I don't remember the exact. In the army, right, right. You know, uh, bre you know, breakdown. But I went through the yeshiva. You know, of course, I, I couldn't help it. I had to go through and see everything. I went to see the big matters. Now, the, now they're, they're back. And I spoke even to the head of the yeshiva. And he spoke to us, wow, he's a short little guy. He was talking with such bravismo. And then afterwards, at the end of his talk, it was very crowded. I realized he'd been standing on a chair, you know, because he was such a strong persona. Um, you know, you didn't realize he was a short little guy, brought everybody back, he's having soldiers, also um, using part of the dorms that are empty for them to be able to stay in. I took a picture from the top and I went up to the roof. They took some rockets that had been fired at them and built arts. Like there's a tree there made out of remnants of a rocket. There's a, a menorah there made oh, wow. out of remnants from rockets. Wow. And that have been fired at Sterot. This is the view. 360 degrees all the way around. They had seen the infiltration of the terrorists from this view up top. Um, and one of the things he said was, he said, well, you see this view, you see this view. Well, soon you won't be able to see this view because we are coming back and we're building. And we're continuing to build up the city. And before you know it, you won't be able to see the view because it's going to be packed. <laughs> so he has a sense of like everyone should come back home. And so, uh, Devorah, Devorah, living in Steyrot, obviously the question on your mind would be, how is security different today than on October 7th? Well, they're filled with, you know, soldiers and so on there. But when I'm taking you to this, this picture, this is what happened in Steyrot. They, the terrorists took hold of the police station, this beautiful, you know, advanced, developed police station. And they took, you know, hostages. They took, and they basically went into the station and were, using the top of the uh, roof as well to shoot anyone who tried to come near. And they held this police station hostage with hostages in it for a long time until they realized there were no longer any hostages in there or hostages alive. And they bombed this to the ground. So what you see here is a lot that once had a police station there and the, the sniper on the roof, the terrorist sniper was stopping anyone from getting near to, to, to be able to put an end to this attack. And a guy took a gun, you know, a handgun. He went up to the second floor of this building across the street, went into someone's apartment, put, poked out his gun from there and shot the, the sniper from that second floor apartment. Um, it's part of like the heroism you hear about. Crazy all stuff. People, the heroes. Crazy stuff. Yeah. This had been a, a fire station next door to the police station that had already been moved elsewhere. So it was empty during that time. And uh, Devorah, what's amazing is the planning that the terrorists so had gone through in order to destroy as much as possible. They were very, very well planned, weren't they? Yeah, there was a lot of planning involved. I like there were people in the yeshiva on October seventh, and they they don't know why they didn't go into people's homes there. They were a little, they acted a little bit differently in the city than they did in the in the Yishuvim. And then from there, we went to the Zikim, which is an army base today. And there was a very big battle in Zikim on October 7th as well. I think that went on for many days. Um, and they showed us sort of where they were, you know, where they had been uh, fighting, as you could see here, a lot of the the rock, the, the shooting that had been uh, perpetrated against the base. And here is the exit where the tanks and the, uh, and the vehicles go into Gaza. Um, Devor, from your so, from your understanding, I mean, as you said, there was a basis, an uh, an army base in the in the exact area where the terrorist attacks were taking place. From what you understand at this point in time, 
Did that army base respond quickly and well? Were they shell shocked? You know, the narrative out there is the question is where was the army? And in this case, the yeah. army was right there. How did they respond? I'm not an expert on this. Yeah. Nobody is. Nobody has clear answers right now. I really don't feel like I can answer that. Okay. You know, I think that. Uh, Fair enough. I think that that's questions, you know, those questions are so important that they be answered that the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the branch of the army that essentially is in charge of the government that's in charge of, of uh, investigating government offices already started the investigation a few months ago. And they said, why are you doing this? First, let's finish the war, then we'll investigate. And they said, no, we're already collecting certain files, data, information. The investigation already started because you know, those questions are really important. But on the, gra- on the ground, is there not a narrative that people are sort of harboring at this point in time? Is, you know, very- it depends who you ask. You know, um, it depends what region, what area. Um, some, some places, you know, for example, the Army used to not let soldiers bring guns home when they would be home for the weekend. So the, you know, there was full entire communities where they had no way to you know, defend themselves. And they had a locked box of weapons at the entrance to the kibbutz. And this is what we saw in Barry, and I'll tell you about that in a second. But to get to that locked box meant being, you know, snipered or killed on your way. And they didn't really have any weapons. I think um, there was one community that had no weapons at all. Not one civilian bullet was shot the entire time. And they were massacred for days. Okay. So um, take us to your next trip. Okay. okay. So then the next trip that I made, um, and I was telling you a little bit about that, was an Ativa Sarah, which, um, which was like right on the border. I told you it's also where the border crossing is. Be'eri, which, you know, everyone knows, is, is, you know, a very, was very badly hit, a lot of uh, terrible massacres there. And then right in, which is where the um, music, the Nova right. part, music party was. Okay. Right. Um, now, I think the day we went down was 120 days to October 7th. And there were many family members who came to Raim. And I'll tell you about that in a second. But um, essentially, like, they kind of went as like a memorial to um, to be there on, at that. To their children, day, right? Like yeah. Yeah, children and so on. Um, so, you know, once again, like as I was... Uh, you know, as I was going through, I kind of realized once again, like how beautiful and green it is. And wow, I was just like, you know, I was just blown away by that. And um, so like here, you know, was when I got to the south and we were, we had went into Nativasra and I told you beautiful homes, beautiful homes. No one is living there right now. Um, you can see parts of the roof that were, you know, fell off, you know, that were, you know, that were uh, uh, shot at by uh, uh, rockets. So they were, you know, it exploded their pieces all over the ground. And this is the border from where we were standing. That's the border right there. Like, and he watched those parachuters glide over the border. Um, and they went up to their, their window and it was facing that border. And he tried to stop them. One of them got over and he later found out, you know, that they had gone to one of his neighbors and, you know, they, 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 you can see the window here. So he would go, not this one, this is the cross street, this window, like this is windows facing the border and he and his son and the neighbor who had a gun, each of them, not many bullets, kind of positioned themselves up there to try to defend the region. And as we were, you know, going through it, he showed us the different parts of the, I mean, look at this. It's so beautiful. Yeah, there's so a real beautiful. trade-off living yeah. in the South. On one hand, you're clearly giving up security, sometimes more times than others, but the ability to build gorgeous houses and cities and villages is is really palpable. It's very beautiful down there. So this is like the border crossing where they would um, help uh, uh, Palestinians from Gaza to come in and get medical care. It's called Tiva Shalom. This was the crossing where they would come through, and they had bulldozed it, and and just come right in, and um, 
you know, on October 7th and you know, there was terrible, uh, you know, you can see, like, I, I just kept taking pictures on my map to see where I was, yeah. you know, like to get a sense of where I am, you know, on the map, like here's the border and that's where I am, you know, and that blue dot. Um, and I just was looking, you know, this is, this is, they built it and they put the dove on. I mean, it was, they had peaceful intentions. Many of them always, you know, were involved in bringing over these um, uh, people for medical care. And then we walked through and we saw some of the homes and, you know, I mean, this was the home that was completely massacred and you see still the sign of the family, the house sign, you know, like with their name mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. And this is like what's left, you know, so. Total destruction. Again, yeah. And beautiful, beautiful trees. And this was a rainy day. And then there was another house, which they took us into. We're not, you, we only go into a house if we were given permission by the owners, yes, yes. obviously. And it was a little bit of, you weren't allowed to take pictures inside, but you know, you just see like, look, the tricycle at the front door and the inside, the door is smashed. And, you know, we couldn't take pictures on the inside, but I'm assuming you, I'm sick. assuming you weren't supposed to pick up anything and take anything with you. Did you take anything? No, 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 nothing. No, no, no. Um, so like even here, I got a notification while we're there that there's a rocket attack and we're supposed to go into shelter. You have 15 seconds. I mean, we didn't, we were in the bus. What were we supposed to do? There was nothing we could do. And that was it. We just kept going. So this is where um, Kibbutz Berry, you know, the, the Berry and the person who gave us a tour, his brother was killed. His, he said it was an ideal upbringing, grew up there. His family was there. He said it was home. They all knew each other. He said life was ideal until October 6th. He said everyone was still riding their bikes, visiting their friends, and walking around outside and living that ideal kibbutz life. He said it was ideal. No one ever thought if you left, it's because of a job in the center or something, but you didn't leave that ideal life out of choice. He was, it was just their home. And for him, as opposed to in Kfar Aza, where the people who were taking us around were first responders. This was his home. Yeah. So he didn't really want to walk us through. He just wanted to tell us a story. So we, I realized at some point that he wasn't moving. He was just standing and talking. And, um, and that's what he needed. He needed to feel like he could tell the story. And then at some point he did start to walk us through and show us the different families and their homes um, did and who had lived there and, what happened in that home. And I mean, you can see the homes are destroyed in the question, you know, we ask, of course, is what do you want to do with this? The kibbutz on this, these properties, this land, do you want to rebuild? Do you want to create a museum? You know, do you want to, do you want it to be, you know, what do you want it to be? And um, they said like, there's, you know, they're conflicted now, which is why they're not really doing anything, you know? Um, sorry, I just well, that. they're still in shock, That's right? Fine. It's very early on. Yeah, I think they're in shock. I think um, they don't really know what they want to do with the area. Like, do you preserve it? Like, is that something you want to preserve? Or is it something that you want to, you know, uh, rebuild on? You know, like, it's, it's not uh, Germany, you know, it's not it's not European land, you know, where no one, Jews aren't going to live anymore. Like, Jews want to live here, right? Like, what do you do about that? You know, how, how do you... Yeah. Um, I think the you know, the, the, so, the mo of the Jewish people is to rebuild, <clears throat> and I'm I'm assuming that's going to happen with some parts left um, as museums, and I think that that's probably appropriate, and that's probably what'll happen. Can we go to your uh, trip in the north? Right. I just want to actually show you one thing at the end, yep. which uh, uh, we didn't, uh, and I'm just going to go through Barry, but. You know, one of the things, uh, by the way, this is an amazing story, which they told us about this family that came from and saved these families. Like there was people who got in their cars on the day of, drove south and saved people. Yes. And this house was one of those families who did that. They drove in, oh, saved this family, and later visited them. But I just want to show you quickly the pictures of the of the Nova um, Memorial, because that's really interesting to see. This was an elderly area. They had an elderly, sorry, there's an elderly area in Barry. Um, and just one second. Um, I'm just gonna take you quickly to, um, 
to the Nova. Mm. Okay. So, um, so then when we arrived here at the Nova festival, you see also the, tr the sun setting through the trees. I mean, look at that. Yes. You see the sun setting. Yeah, look at that. Um, I met some comedians who I know there who were on their way to do a show for soldiers. You know, to picture. Everybody's playing their role. Yeah, that was their role. And then you come here and this is it. Everyone who was there has a memorial. And there were people going around and lighting candles. Um, lighting candles for these people. Many of them, you know, there's a list of the names. Um, this family was standing around the grandmother uh, there, was a, there was a father who was at the nova festival with his daughter in a wheelchair this was the family the grandmother she came you know she wanted to talk about it as well i think that's you know, people put yeah it's a well-known story that one yeah so this is the nova festival and then we did of course the barbecue for the soldiers again um as i mentioned to you one of the things about the barbecue was that uh you know, when we did the barbecue, we knew that they were going in together the next day. And then, you know, we would, and we've been in touch with them to kind of keep in touch and see what, you know, how they're doing. And, you know, people who organize the trip, they know some of those soldiers. So, you know, they know the, oh, let's say the person who, who was the head of the unit. And so we have heard about people being killed, especially when recently about 21 soldiers were killed. Building some of them had been from the barbecue we did after Barry. And I remember talking to everyone there. I tried to talk to all the soldiers. Um, and uh, so that was difficult, but. You know, Devorah, you know, I, th like I think one of the reasons that I, I had really never had an interest of going to Auschwitz um, is really because of, in my head, it's the idea of walking on that land and knowing what had happened there. And probably, you know, hearing the screams of people and uh, seeing them, it, that that is something which is, would be very uncomfortable for me. Did you experience any of that in Nava, where the uh, where the music fest was? It's not that long ago that hundreds of children were young people. Young people were running for their lives. Is your imagination that fertile, or or is that is that me? I don't think I thought about it like that. I d kind of was looking at. Um, I always think about how I wish that people had thought bubbles over their heads, well, you know, like so that you could know what they were thinking. Cause I could see these emotions on everyone's faces who were there. Um, who are you? Why are you lighting this candle? Yeah. Who are you visiting? Were you there? Or is this someone you loved or knew, you know, and you, you can't ask every person their story, you know, but you walk around and you see all these living stories walking around. And so in my imagination, I keep trying to envision what that emotion on their face is about. You know, is it is it uh, survival? Is it memory? You know, is it pain? Is it sadness? Yeah, who are these people and where have they come from, right? What are, yeah, what yeah are... that to me was so real, you know, seeing these people there. And at one point, a group of young guys who were there, I guess, from Yeshiva, they just put their arms around each other and started singing mm -hmm. like they needed to. It's, it's such a powerful thing walking through those signs mm -hmm. that like they, you know, I think there's a Jewish, there's a Jewish side to singing, you know, like no question. I, mean, I don't remember what they sang, but no question. There are four times in the Torah that a song is actually mentioned. And I always felt that's really something that we are so moved by singing and song. Dvorah, can you walk us through your, uh, your, your trip in the North? Yeah, so the North is a different story. And you mentioned about, you know, the idea of evacuation. Like, how does a family feel? How do people feel being evacuated? And this is a little bit of a different story because we didn't believe that the North wasn't at risk. We believe that there was, there was a vulnerability to the North. But because of October 7th, the vulnerability, we implemented that vulnerability onto the North. I'm not saying this not there's a war going on there. I mean it's it's dangerous. And but the idea of taking all of the residents of the north out of their homes is I think a very unprecedented unprecedented thing. 
in Israel to take Jews out of their homes because there may be a risk. Um, I don't remember Jews leaving their homes in Israel because there may be a risk. And not everybody, not everybody home. agreed with it, did they? No, I think it was really tough for them to like leave their homes. And you know, when you look at neighborhood like cities like Kiryat Shmona, which is a poor city, you know, you have a falafel stand. Where, what are you living on now? Like, where, where, what are you doing? How are you going to come back to that falafel stand that probably has a million cats living in there? And like, how do you do that? Like, how do you do that to the families who like had jobs or whatever and children taken out of school? I mean, we saw what it was like in COVID when kids couldn't go to school. And, you know, many kids have been, re, you know, replaced in, you know, they've been placed in other areas across the country and so on. But I don't know. How do you how do you do that to like entire city? What was interesting is when you were up north, uh, you heard from a number of different speakers, including uh, Brigadier General Giora Inbar, who he himself had a very difficult time with the idea of the evacuation. Right? Yeah, and I, I hope I'm not misquoting him, but I felt like there was something about you know this idea of of saying why as a country would we take people out of their homes. I felt like that was a unique position that I hadn't heard someone express so explicitly, you know, and openly, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of doubt um, towards our government. You know, there's a lot of doubt and the lack of trust and, you know, and, and, you know, so on and so forth. I can go on for a while. Uh, but to hear people say that, you know, made me think a lot about it. I've been thinking about it a lot. It's a lot since then. But we went north for a different reason. Yeah. So the government had said every with the date that everyone will go back to the north of so their homes will be in July. Recently, they moved it to September. I don't even know what those dates mean. Today, we have a conflict happening in the northern borders. And there's the day after. Day after. Nobody knows when the day after will be and what it'll look like. But we have to build the bridge as people of hope. And as people of building and innovation and and of you know and of growth, we have to start building that bridge because we just have to build the bridge. We don't know what that point that day after will look like, but we know we need to start building that bridge. And part of building that bridge is providing support, whether it's remotely, whether it's off-site, whatever it is, providing the sorry, did I did I get disconnected? No, you're still there. Keep on going. Um is providing the support that is needed in order for them to be able to uh, maintain their businesses, their service offering, whatever they're doing, their startups, their companies, their families, um, and to keep that you know going. So that was what we did in the north, and and um, you know I work for an organization that uh, very much focuses on economic development, but we're super engaged in the north, and um, and we went north that day to meet with all of our partners. So, you know, universities, investors, service providers, all of that, Kibbutzim, research institutes, all of that, and about 70 startups, good, high quality startups and investors who all came there to meet up together and to talk about the fact that we are coming back to the North. We're not letting them keep us out of the North anymore. Yeah, that's that to me is very fascinating that Israel only 120 days out is already planning for the future. And, and that I think is why Israel is considered the startup nation and uh, so well-respected in most parts of the world or many parts of the world uh, for this mindset. And that that's yeah. what you were part of. And I commend you for that. Um, I think it's really brilliant that you took that trip as well as your colleagues, other people who you did not know, to go there and say, okay, listen, things are bad. They're still bad. We're, we're still at war, but we need to figure out where this is going to go in the future, how we're going to rebuild. And that, I think, is the mindset of the Israeli, and that, I think, is the, is the thing that makes Israel strong. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think there's also, as I said to you before, we've become a socially oriented, supported company. It's the people who are the leaders, the strong individuals, you heard stories of heroism, but but the heroism doesn't stop. You know the families um, who are, you know, continuing on with their lives. The uh, all the different parts of the country that are supporting each other. 
and uh, yeah, we need to keep doing that. So to me, that gives me that gives me hope. That gives me motivation to keep going, and that's kind of what we were doing. Um, I just you know, and and the pictures now are very different than you know what I showed you in the in the south because you know these are pictures of uh, you know of uh, of reconnecting of. So by the way, that's the mountains of the north, you know, um, coming into Kibbutz Machanaim, going to the cafe there, meeting up with amazing people, you know, who are all there with this, you know, with the goal of supporting the startups. Um, this is Dror Bin, he's the head of the Innovation Authority and as well, um, meeting with startups, um, like I said, people are there to support investors, um, you know, donors, people who are part of this, um, you know, this ecosystem. It's and what is, you know, one of the common um, notes that people kept saying over and over, and I really try to speak to everybody there. You know, as we said, I'm a I'm a schmoozer. You are I'm a good talker. I'm a good talker You're a networker, yes. Networker, but one of the things that everybody kept saying to me was, "Wow, this was I needed this. I needed to come out and meet with people in person. I needed to see people. I needed to, you know, uh, to meet with my partners. You know, to meet with the people who are supportive of my, you know, of my startup to to give me hope again." To give me hope that you know this is what we're going to do. This is where we're moving forward. And once again, I had to take a picture on my drive because these mountains. Like I pulled over to take the picture. Like, wow, it's unbelievable. The beauty the is still there. Are, yeah, yeah. The beauty is still there. Devorah, I want to uh, wrap up our interview here, and I want to do so by saying thank you so much um, for your bravery and your courage for living in Israel, for sending some of your own children to the army. Um, I often say uh, on my podcast, we here in diaspora send our kids off to university. In Israel, you wait for that. You, you send them off to, to the army first, and therefore they might find themselves fighting for not only Israel, not only the Jews in Israel, but the Jews everywhere in the world. So I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for this report and for taking these trips. And I truly look forward to uh, subsequent trips where you can report back to us on, on the, as I say, the Matzav in Israel, because there's a lot of the situation in Israel. There's a lot of curiosity here as to how the Israelis are responding, what, what's happening now on the ground, uh, what's next. And you alluded to some of that, that there are preparations that are currently uh, happening. So I'm Yisrael Chai. The nation of Israel lives and shall continue to live forevermore. And Devorah, thank you so much for this. I appreciate it. Can I just wrap up with something as well? Yes, I please. Hope that, yep. Well, I hope that the next time we speak, you know, as I mentioned to you, that we're building that bridge to the day towards the day after, and I hope they'll be able to share things that are happening on a on a positive level, on a positive note of how we're rebuilding, how our hostages are coming home, you know, how we're helping families to rebuild and to reunite. Good. Um, yeah. and and so that's you know that's my hope and my blessing for us. So. Amen. You are listening to the Avram Rosenzweig show. I hope you uh, got something out of it. Make sure to be part of the war effort on any level. Sometimes it's as simple as increasing or enhancing the goodness that you give out to the world. And uh, make sure that you're cognizant of that and that you share that with your loved ones and friends. We will be back again soon. And uh, we look forward to sharing with you more information about Israel and the Jewish world. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being here. The Avram Rosenzweig Show. It's a podcast with fascinating people who have inspirational stories to share with us. Thank you.